Now, I'm a big sports fan, and we don't tend to think about chemistry and sports as going together. But if you do, you're probably thinking about those athletes that are trying to get that extra edge over their opponents by using chemistry, let's say, to help improve. Now, things like the Olympics and Major League Sports have drug testing protocols in place to test their athletes. But how do these athletes actually get tested? What is the process for testing these athletes, and what do we find out about those things that are in their system? Well, one of the devices that we can use is something called a mass spectrometer. Hmm. So the way that this works is that the sample is placed into the mass spectrometer, and then it's ionized, that is, it's given a charge. It's then accelerated through a magnetic field, and the degree to which it responds to the magnetic field, or is altered by the magnetic field, ultimately relates to its mass. The larger particles are going to be deflected less by the magnetic field, and the lighter particles are going to be deflected more. Now, these particles and the amount that they're deflected is then detected and anal analyzed and interpreted by the mass spec, and it gives us ultimately a percentage of the compounds or elements in that particular sample. This percentage, or this makeup, is then compared to known samples of known banned substances, and it's established whether or not the individual had these banned substances in their sample at the time. So what this ultimately gives us is a percent composition of those elements that are found in the sample. And as I alluded to in a previous video, this will allow us to ultimately figure out something called the empirical formula, and then from there, the actual molecular formula of the compound that may be found in the athlete's sample. But we have to understand what empirical and molecular mean first of all. So empirical is just the simplest whole number ratio of elements in a particular compound, the lowest whole number ratio. So it's important to note that all ionic compounds are found in their empirical formula because all ionic compounds are represented in their lowest or simplest whole number ratio. For example, NaCl is one sodium to one chlorine, MgCl2 is one magnesium to two chlorine, and so on and so forth. A molecular compound could be represented in its empirical formula, like NO2 or nitrogen dioxide. You can't get any simpler than a 1 to 2 ratio. The molecular formula is what we use when we apply this simplest ratio to a molecular compound, because the molecular compound is the actual ratio of each element in the compound. Not simplified, it's the actual ratio or the actual molecular formula. So in the case of dinitrogen tetraoxide, or N2O4, that is the actual molecular compound of that, uh, actual molecular formula of that particular compound. So it is N2O4. That's not its empirical formula. You notice the empirical formula of dinitrogen tetraoxide would be NO2, but that's just the simplest ratio of nitrogens to oxygen. The actual molecular formula is made up of two nitrogens bound to four oxygens. So how do we go about using these percentages to figure out the molecular formula? Well, we first have to establish the empirical formula. So let's take a look at an example and see how we might do that. So here, let's say we have performed a chemical analysis in which we have found the following percent compositions of a compound that contain both carbon and hydrogen. Now notice, these are percent of the compound by mass. But if we think about a chemical formula, chemical formula is given to us by number, the number of carbon to hydrogen. Here we have a relationship between the mass of carbon and hydrogen to this overall compound. So we have to have some way that we can convert mass into a number relationship. And molar mass is going to help us do that. So what I would like you to do is try and follow along with this problem as I go through the steps, and hopefully you can arrive at the same answer that I do. So let's take a look. So typically when you're given a problem like this, the best way to communicate your answer clearly is to set up a table. And the way that I set up my tables is that across the top, I put the elements that are involved. So in this case, we have carbon and hydrogen. And down the side, I put the mass, molar mass, and number of moles of those components. Because remember, we're really trying to convert here between mass and number. And it's molar mass that's going to be the go-between to allow us to do that. So you'll notice down the side I have m representing mass in grams, molar mass representing the molar mass in grams per mole, and n representing, of course, moles. 
Now notice also that I've set this up so that we can take mass divided by molar mass and equal the number of moles, which is just the relationship between mass, number of moles, and molar mass expressed down the side. So what we're then going to do is assume that we have a mass of 100 grams of a substance. Now the reason that we assume 100 grams is just because those percentages are going to add up to 100%. So it's best to use 100 grams. You really could use any mass, but again, because they're adding up to 100%, 100 grams is going to be the easiest thing to use. And you'll notice that if I do that, then I can just convert my percentages directly into grams, and I have 92.3 grams of 100 gram sample representing carbon, and 7.7 .7 grams of 100 gram sample representing hydrogen. So I'm then going to divide it by the molar mass of each of the elements. So for carbon, 12.01, and for hydrogen, 1.01. And if I take the mass and divide it by the molar mass, that will allow me to establish the number of moles. And you can see here that for carbon I have 7.69 moles, and hydrogen I have 7.62 moles. Now, one of the common mistakes that are made here is that students will automatically try to enter these values into the molecular formula or into the formula of that particular compound, and that is incorrect. We're trying to establish a ratio between these two. So in order to do that, we're going to take the lowest molar value and divide each of those molar values by the lower of the two molar values. So you can see here that hydrogen has a slightly lower molar value, and when we divide each of these by that slightly lower molar value, we effectively get a one-to-one -one ratio. And so now we're going to use this ratio to figure out the formula or empirical formula of the compound, and we can see that it's one carbon to one hydrogen, so the empirical formula is CH. You'll notice that in the chemical analysis, we were also given the molecular mass of this particular compound. So that will allow us to use the empirical formula to figure out the molecular formula, the actual molecular formula of this particular compound. So the next step then is to determine the mass of the empirical formula, and we refer to this as the empirical formula mass. And since the empirical formula is CH, it's just going to be the mass of one mole of carbon and the mass of one mole of hydrogen. And together, those two equal 13.02 grams per mole. Since we know the actual molecular mass of the compound is 78.12, we're going to take that 78.12 and divide it by the empirical formula mass. Because we know the two of them, that is the actual molecular formula and the empirical formula, are going to have the same ratio. It's just that the molecular formula might be two or three or four times larger because there are two or three or four times more carbon, more hydrogen in that particular compound. So in doing that calculation, we can find that the factor by which the molecular compound is larger than the empirical co uh, compound is six. So we then take this factor, multiply it by the empirical formula, and we can see here that we ultimately arrive at the molecular formula of this compound, C6H6. There is one thing that I want to point out before we move on, and that is sometimes in establishing your empirical formula, you do all of the steps and you divide by the lowest molar ratio and you find that you don't get immediately a nice whole number ratio. That is, it's not one to one or one to two. You get a number like one to 1.2 or 1.33. Well, you still have to maintain that ratio, but have a whole number ratio. And so sometimes we have to multiply that ratio by a number. So let's say it's 1 to 1.2, well, you're going to have to multiply that ratio by 5 to get a ratio of 5 to 6. It maintains the ratio, but it involves whole numbers now. So you can see here that I've set up some of those relationships that you might have to go to sometimes in order to get that whole number ratio. So hopefully this video not only helped you establish how to calculate empirical and ultimately molecular formula for an unknown compound from percent composition, but also how chemistry can help catch those individuals who are using their own chemistry for the wrong reasons. Thanks for watching. Did you like this video? Did you not like the video? Was there something that seemed like it was a little off? Well, either way, we want to hear about it. So like us or leave a comment in the section below as to things that we could change or improve. And if you want to see more videos like this, you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube or follow us on Twitter.